let's sit back and relax as we take a look at the most entertaining stories for this week. Welcome to Mainly Facts, weekly compilation. If you want to look back at this week's stories, this one is the best fit for you. Whether you're having your day off or chilling with friends, have fun by watching to this compilation. Leave your timestamp of your favorite stories and share it with everyone. Let's start with the video. Story 25. We noticed that she was falling asleep a lot at work, so that got all of our attention. She usually took 10 minute naps throughout the day, which isn't a big deal because you can have breaks, but our alarms went up. One of the employees heard a crackling beer can in the bathroom one day. Saw her come out of the bathroom and check the trash cans 10 minutes later, beer confirmed. Also some weird blood spots on paper towels too. We searched her belongings and found several other beer cans and a funnel. Notice that she didn't have any alcohol on her breath. My face when we realized she was butt chugging the <laughs> Miller High Life to get lit at work. <laughs> no! Why? Ugh. Look, I I'm sorry, I'm laughing at the butt chugging comment. Alcoholism is no joke and this woman clearly needs some help. But that is just, that is wild and I wasn't ready to read that. Story 30. Took a temp job leading the Santa's Village at Bass Pro while waiting on my contract to start at my career job. The people you hire are usually interesting. One girl on her first shift was on her phone as I walked back to the department. I wasn't in uniform yet, but told her, you aren't supposed to be on your phone on shift. She screams, who the F are you? I walked away, clocked in, wrote her up, and came back to her with a write-up. She turned out to be one of the better employees. Are you really going to enforce rules like that at a Bass Pro Shop Santa's Village? Frankly, if I'm there with my non-existent kids and I don't see any of the teenage employees on their phones, I'm going to assume it's a terrifying work environment and will call someone to help them. Story 31. I had an employee call and tell me her mother died. Well, I got an anonymous phone call from someone telling me she was lying, so I called the number I had on file to send my regards, and I got an address to send flowers. In the meantime, the office had collected an envelope of money to help with the costs of the funeral and missing work. When I called, the mother answered and was shocked to find out her daughter used her death as an excuse to go to Vegas for the weekend. When she returned, I held a big meeting with everyone in the office and presented her with the envelope of money and flowers. She took it and faked crying. I called her into my office to reveal that I knew and fired her and took the envelope back. She said she don't give up blank and left. Story 32. The owner's nephew was brought on to be an assistant manager. In the same night, he effed some random floozy on the office desk on top of the staff paychecks and when we closed up for the night, he stumbled into the bar next door where I was having a nightcap with industry friends. He didn't see me, but he threw his credit card down and said, I'm a club owner, I drink for free here. He kept shouting that until he was asked to leave. He didn't last long. Story 33. Not too crazy, but uh, pretty stupid. I had a girl that worked for me at a mortgage company pull the credit report of her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. No idea how she got her social security number and then went on the girl's Facebook page posting messages about all of her debt and past due accounts and the crappy kinds of car that she drives, etc. Got an angry call from the girl who ended up being a pain in my butt for a while. Edit. Forgot an interesting part. We fired the girl, and about a week later, an agent from the Department of Treasury comes in asking questions about the girl. Turns out she was being investigated for a series of fraudulent things, including operating as a loan officer without a license and taking out a bunch of federal student loans in her grandfather's name. He wanted information because in investigating, learned that she had been fired from the company for some sort of malfeasance and he wanted the details. She went to jail for a while, eventually. This sounds like it would make for a moderately interesting movie. It's like a much less well thought out version of that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio movie where he was some kind of scam artist getting away with all kinds of crap. Uh, Titanic, that's it. Story 34. The owner made me cut hours while keeping his son on full time. As a silent protest, everyone took an extra long smoke break that day. When I went outside to corral the troops, I overheard the craziest thing. An employee defending me against the charges, I was a weak butt kisser who failed to stand up for them. He's got to feed his family just like everybody else. And she continued to defend me even after the others labeling her as a quizzling, which was really crazy given the state of education in America. I'm shocked they even knew what that meant. 
Story 38. Not a boss, but used to work for an MSP. They had an office with a big tile missing in the ceiling. Apparently, they had this accountant who was working late one night. The next day, everyone comes into the office and they find said ceiling hole. Turns out the accountant heard God calling her from the ceiling. She proceeded to climb up her desk into the ceiling and managed to get into one of the offices next door. Story 39. Had an employee that was always falling asleep while riding around from job to job. It was time for him to get his CDL for the company and had to travel about two hours away for testing. Halfway into his trip, we checked where he was and the truck had been running for an hour about 45 minutes from the test site at a truck stop. Had to call a gas station attendant to wake him up. Still hadn't contacted me. About 30 minutes later, we got a call from a guy that he had run off the road. The company name is number is on the side of the truck. We checked the GPS and it showed him driving 70 miles per hour down to 20 miles per hour right around the time the incident happened. He ended up passing his test and making it back to the shop. I asked him what the F he is on. H? He said. No, I was smoking M all night. Honesty isn't always the best policy. Story 43. I'm a supervisor for a pretty strict, no-nonsense German company. A lot of our employees have a constant feeling of despair, and let it be known. Some situations that have happened are below. 1. Poop smeared all over the bathroom stalls every day for weeks. 2. Carvings in the bathroom wall of tyranny, despair, certain manager is not good, competing company pays much better, etc. 3. Admittedly, the company treats employees badly. An employee's car was totaled when a neglected light pole fell on it. The company refuses to pay for it, and it has been in the parking lot for months. After about two months, every single manager in the building had their expensive cars keyed. Story 45 was middle management at my old job. I had a team below me, but plenty of awful people above me. Had one of my people specifically request only closing shifts because it was easier on her family for childcare purposes. After a month of this, she blanked at my blanking awful boss about no shift diversity. He talked with me about it, ignored the fact that she had requested it, and demanded her I give her day shifts. So I gave her three day shifts. She missed all of them, blamed me for not giving her the night shift she wanted. My FWAD boss yelled at me for giving her day shifts too, despite me telling him this would happen when he forced me to do it initially. Firing the girl for missing so many shifts, she recruited five guys, the father of her various children, to come yell at me for ruining her source of income. <laughs> I just realized I read it as five guys, the restaurant, and not that she literally recruited five guys. I'm going to get this restaurant to come yell at you. Story 51. I worked in a call center, which should be all that needs to be said. I once caught an agent cutting out lines of white powder and then snorting them. I caught countless agents breaking apart pot to roll up in joints, blunts, packs of bowl. I had a girl walk into one of my training sessions, grab the wastebasket, and proceed to pull all of her weave out. I had a girl disappear from my training class, and we later found her passed out in a puddle of her own crap, pee, and vomit in the handicap stall in the bathroom. I had a lady who was too damn lazy to get up and walk to the restroom, so she decided to just crap her pants at her desk, then proceed to shake the turd out of her pant leg. I have so many stories from that place, I have seriously considered writing a screenplay. Call centers are not my speed, as I've made clear with the fact that I only worked in one for two days. Look, you want the Jesus lady story? Here you go. I was calling getting voter info. I would ask for the name listed in our system as the head of the household. This lady answered, and I was required to ask, is blank there? She replied, and I quote, no, but do you know who is? Jesus. I know this sounds like I'm making it up. But I was already thinking of quitting, so I just sighed and replied, Well, is he planning on voting? I don't recall exactly what she said after that, but she preached to me for a few minutes, hung up, and I left. Most women think there's nothing wrong with being abusive and cruel with men. It's so upsetting watching women treat men like absolute crap. To top it off, men are expected to still act like a gentleman, and also they're not allowed to feel vulnerable or to feel sad angry because some lady was just a little sassy, when in reality she was being an abusive piece of crap. Edit. I'm a woman, not a heartbroken dude. Thanks for your concern, lol. Also, it has come to my attention that I didn't get my point across very well. By most women, I mean most women I know. I don't claim to know what most women think. I'm just talking from my experience. I've also been cruel to men. It's just too ingrained in our culture that being mean to men is acceptable. It isn't. 
We cannot expect to have an equal society if we don't treat men with respect, tolerance, and kindness. Thinking that you can treat men like crap just because they're mean is sexist, and we shouldn't tolerate it. We are responsible for creating the world we want to live in. Hope I explain myself better. Have a nice day. Probably being forced to never, well, feel. There are so many people who make fun of guys for having feelings or even showing them. I would never be able to deal with it, and my heart broke the day my boyfriend told me his exes used to verbally abuse him for crying in front of them. Edit. Changed words because I didn't want to make a personal generalization. Edit part two. I didn't think this would blow up so fast. I've taken the afternoon into the evening reading every single one of your guys' replies, and I am genuinely devastated by some of the things I'm reading. Men, I'm so sorry. Words kind of fail me right now because I don't know what to say to any of you. What I want to say, though, is that you're all incredibly strong human beings and you are that, a human being. With thoughts, feelings, emotions, and dreams, your feelings are valid. You all deserve to feel and to be seen, heard, and cared for as a human being. I have to admit, even I, a pretty out there, theatrical, very emotional person, didn't feel as okay exposing my emotions to others. I remember being mocked as a kid and bottling that crap away, and it definitely hurt people close to me at times. I've gotten a lot better with help from loved ones and am trying to strive to be even better. It feels good, guys. Find yourself some loved ones that let you open up. Story 7. To everyone who thinks it has something to do with our D's slash balls, I promise we have much bigger problems than our nut sacks sticking to our thighs. We're increasingly assumed to be predators, apparently. We have a self-termination rate that is through the roof compared to women. We have a harder time getting custody in divorces because it's assumed that women are the obvious caretakers by default. Increasingly, there's tons of stuff about girl pride, but little boys are pretty well screwed if they try to be proud of being a boy. I'll gladly take some ball sweat if all that other stuff will go away. Story 8. Hands down, always being the villain. A colleague of mine was a bit on the heavier side, but decided to get into shape and started jogging. So he jogs around his block daily until his smartwatch tells him his quota for the day is full. That day he was a bit late, but went for a jog when the sun was setting. Not many people out there, but as he was on his way, some girls saw him jogging their way, got scared and called the cops on him for obviously trying to chase them to abuse them or something. Now, the guy didn't know about the call. He just sees two girls seeing him coming, turning around and running away, and he's like, what the F? Until the cops come for him. You know, for the biggest offense in the whole human history, trying to get fit. I really felt bad for him. Story 9. Honestly, probably people just assuming that you'll do all the gross crap that no one else wants to do. Fixing up the car, unclogging the toilet, cleaning out the spider webs in the attic, scrubbing the mildew off the bathtub. Guys are just expected to do it all without complaint because that's the manly thing to do. As a woman, I find it pretty unfair. Alongside that are hiding a boner, people assuming that you can't have mental illnesses slash disorders, not being allowed to cry slash show emotions slash be insecure about your body. All of it is really unfair. I'm sorry, guys. I feel really lucky in that I have a supportive group of friends who all aren't like this with me or other guys. And frankly, a lot of the communities I'm in, you don't see men being treated like this. So it kind of surprises me that there are still way too many people in the world who treat men like they should be emotionless, macho donks or nothing. Story 15. Not having your emotions taken seriously, then lashing out because of it, and then seen as violent because you just want to be understood. I had that with abusive parents, but normally people don't treat me that way because I'm a woman. I can't imagine what an entire life of not having your feelings acknowledged in a healthy way feels like. Suck it up and be a man. I admit, I think it's really unhealthy that boys are taught that, and yeah, I think it does lead to a lot of behaviors that can range from unhealthy to downright dangerous. Then again, it doesn't mean they aren't accountable for what they do when they lash out. I feel bad for them, but I feel worse for people they hurt. Story 16. Being considered a possible threat by strangers, probably. Like, I get it, you never know, but it would probably suck. Either that or the D in balls. Like, they're just dangling there? Are they in the way? How do you straddle stuff? Will you accidentally squish them? Do you have to, like, tuck them into your underwear? First, boxer briefs. Comfortable, stylish, and keep everything in place. Second, can you accidentally squish them? Why don't you go ahead and ask Mr. Belvedere? Story 20. Having to be the person physically in charge in a threatening situation. Like always being with a man when walking home from a party in a sketchy area at night. 
Yes, there is safety in numbers, but the dude is expected to be protective regardless of level of awareness, self-defensive, or drunkenness. That's a lot of pressure. Story 23. I would not be allowed a moment of weakness. Bad day? You can't cry unless your mother just died. Hurt yourself? Suck it up and go to the hospital. Feeling self-conscious about your body? Nobody cares. Feeling ill? Someone has a man cold. I mean, are there really that many people that are treating men like this? I'm fully willing to accept that I may just surround myself with people who aren't like the majority of society, but like, I'm seeing so much of this in this thread. I'm getting a little worried for the rest of you. Story 28. Being expected to be the breadwinner generally by society. Being less likely to gain custody of my own kids in a separation. Being disposable in times of war. Do it yourself. And having to deal with my own balls. What if I sat on one? Look, it's less about accidentally sitting on it. It's having a great Dane with a tail that feels like a whip made out of bone that is exactly ball height when it wags. I've been tapped right on the balls too many times and it sucks just as bad each time. Story 32. Being in a crowded urinal, everyone has the D's out standing next to each other. Like, what the hell? Just make stalls. Why have them in the open? Edit, okay, I want to be clear. I act y'all don't stare at each other's Ds or that you stand next together unless necessary. I meant that going at a crowded place and needing to peeing and just try to look straight forward and ignore the dudes near you. Story 33. Feeling uncomfortable or shamed for showing your emotions. It's a sad truth, but since the dawn of time, men have been encouraged to live up to the expectations of having to be tough or being a rock for the family. As a woman, I think we feel more comfortable crying and expressing our sadness. Men get sad too, and it's about time they feel free to express it as easily as women do. Story 34. I would think it would be expected to do all the heavy lifting. To me, as a 64-year-old woman, I do my best to move things on my own. If I must ask for help, I make sure my helpers are well compensated with cold, tasty beverages and snacks slash food. Just because you're a male doesn't mean it's your legacy to be a physical workhorse. It doesn't help when you're a decent height and thicker build. People just assume you love lifting fridges and hauling crap. Granted, I am strong enough to help, but that doesn't mean I want to. Story 37. Not being able to show emotion as much. I'm a very emotional person. I wouldn't even be able to handle it. Let men cry. Let men be outwardly excited about things. Let men have emotional freedom. Edit. What I mean by emotional freedom is to express emotions in a way that is comfortable to you. There isn't a correct way to express emotions, but there is an incorrect way. Don't bottle up your feelings, and don't let people make you feel bad for being emotional. Story 21. In middle school, 8th grade slash early 2000s, one of the hot girls sent a couple nude pictures to her boyfriend, and it wasn't long until half the school had them. Police ended up becoming involved to make sure any copies were destroyed. In high school, there was a little scandal involving the teachers and the teachers club called the Hot Tub Club. Faculty members that had hot tubs would host a weekly hot tub party with other hot tub owners. Turns out they were all getting wasted and having a swinging party every Wednesday. Somebody's spouse found out about it, and there was a huge exodus of hot tub teachers my senior year. Edit. The main people involved with the photo were reprimanded but not charged. The girl had a sit down with a counselor to discuss what happened, and we all had a big assembly to discuss the consequences that could happen if people shared those kind of images. It scared a lot of kids straight. Nobody was fired from the school for being in the hot tub club. The teachers left because it was convenient timing with the opening of another high school, and there was constant babble about it. Just for clarity, this all happened in a small town in western Canada. By the looks of my inbox, both are not uncommon occurrences. Story 24. A guy in year 10 made a statement that the more compact a group of people are, the higher the death toll would be in a shooting, and we were genuinely talking about shootings and somehow people mistook it that he was going to do it. It was a joke and everyone was playing along at first. Cut to 11 months later, he was in year 11, the whole school knows, rumor got out, the truth was beyond effing twisted and changed to something different. Kids were actually scared to come in, parents were peed, teachers were anxious, they had to search the kid, they kicked him out 9 days before he finished for good, was still allowed to do exams but had to do it separately from everyone else. The police were involved and it made the news, but the news article is complete fake and BS. He also wasn't allowed to prom. This was around four to five years ago. He told me he was doing a lot better now. He went to a better school for sixth form.
He says whilst he has moved on with his life, he will never forgive the bastards. Also, we live in England and guns are much harder to get, especially to the average person who knows nothing about how to get guns. I'm all for being careful what you say in schools, especially in this day and age where sadly shootings are something to be worried about. However, I feel like there needs to be a line. Maybe the joke wasn't in the best taste, but if there was no evidence at all beyond a bad joke, to put that kid and the school through that is wrong. Story 25. Some students broke into a local elderly reverend's home to rob him, thinking he was away. He sadly wasn't, and they proceeded to bludgeon him and his wife to death while they were sleeping with baseball bats and beer bottles. They were caught pretty quickly, and although their names legally couldn't be published because they were minors, everyone including the local media knew who committed the crime. Media caused a circus at our school for weeks, harassing any student for commentary. Many did because they thought it was cool. Although these three kids, 13, 14, 15, were known to cause trouble, no one ever suspected they would be capable of a double homicide. Story 27. We had a computer teacher slash football assistant coach who was just blasted all day, had so many DUIs he had to get rides to work, but was the cousin of the superintendent, so he kept his job. Let's just say that when he crashed a student's car in the parking lot because he convinced them to let him borrow it, that was the beginning of the end of it. It was a small town. The scandal is that the super tried to cover it up by trying to convince the kid to take the heat for it. To no one's surprise, the kid was not convinced. They let him stay on as super for another two years. It's almost like people in power, even when there are repercussions for their actions, still get away with more than anyone else. And I'm willing to bet that former superintendent found good work somewhere else. Story 29. My former high school got on the news for having a history teacher lie for four years about being a decorated war hero. Guy claimed to have not one, but two purple hearts, among other things, and never even served a day in the military. Edit, I can't directly link to articles because of doxing, but I'm sure you can find it on Google. But it gets juicier. The truth came out because his ex-wife exposed him, sending evidence he was making it all up to local news stations in the school. Why'd she do it? The history teacher was having an affair with another teacher in my school. We have a lot of weird teachers at my school, but I think this story shows just how much the administration hardly vetted teachers. Like, holy crap. We also had a guidance counselor get the boot for being a racist, but that's another story that didn't get as much publicity. I thought we were going to find out that the teacher's name was actually Armin Tamzarian. And if you get that reference without Googling, I'm going to need to see ya. Let us never speak of this again in the comments. Story 33. This happened between my sister and brother graduating, so it would have been 1996 or 1997. The high school AG teacher started dating a student at some point. Everyone knew about it and the parents consented. Our high school was and is small enough to still participate in senior trips, and the AG teacher went along as a chaperone when his girlfriend was a senior. They shared a hotel room when I believe the student was still technically a 17-year-old minor. At the time, I remember my parents being rather put off by it, but they still hired the guy as a summer farmhand. I don't remember if he was fired or stepped down, but by the time I made it to high school, we had a different AG teacher. They got married and had a child, divorced maybe 5 or 10 years ago. Their kid goes to our high school now. I don't know why it wasn't a huge deal at the time, but no one really raised a stink or threatened to call the authorities. Today it feels like a case of grooming by a predatory farm boy. Uh, you want to know why it feels like that? Probably because that's what it was. Story 34. This girl accused a teacher who had been there for over 40 years of S-assault right before her entrance exam. It was a really good private school, so you needed to take a test to be considered for admission. The accusations were investigated and were found completely unfounded almost immediately. I don't know what this girl was thinking. Like, maybe she thought it was a way for her to get some leverage and improve her chances of getting in or something? What made the scandal even bigger was the actions of the school. They kept him in the dark for two months after the investigation was completed and were refusing to allow him back because of their insurance. Then a campaign was launched by a bunch of alums and he eventually got back to teaching until his death a few years ago. He was a great guy too. I had him for a political theory class and he was really nice. He and his wife, aside from having children of their own, took in foster kids all the time and he did a lot of other volunteer work. Sucks he had to go through all of that because of a lie. Story 35. Reading these, I think the scandals that happen at my school are minor in comparison. 
The ones I know were a kid was busted hacking into the system trying to change his grades. I think there was a claim of computer addiction, but he wasn't allowed on a school computer for the rest of his time at the high school. A teacher was known for trying to pick fights with students. I called out his BS and he was given a slap on the wrist, but he didn't try it again after that. There was a student who was accused of having a bomb that was a complete fabrication. Outcome was ridiculously blown out of proportion. The guy was a bit of an outsider and had made a duct tape top hat. Someone made a sarcastic comment about him smuggling a bomb in it. He responded in same level of sarcasm. Someone gets it in their head that he has a bomb and they decide to kick him out of school because of viable threat. I had a younger cousin who got kicked out of school because of joking about a bomb. I know it's dumb, but folks, I don't think any of the jokes or sarcasm are worth the risk. That kind of crap can stick with you, or worse, get you held back so you have to deal with more school. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 39. My graphics teacher was married to my math teacher, and one night he killed her during a domestic dispute. She was apparently having an affair and started taunting him about it in an argument while waving a fire poker at him. He grabbed it off her, hit her over the head, and killed her. He was sent to prison for manslaughter, not murder, as the court accepted. There was no premeditation. My mom was also a teacher at the school and friends with both of them, so it had a big impact on my family as well as the school. Story 40. My female teacher, late 20s, early 30s, hooked up with my friend before he turned 18 and became obsessed with him. He eventually stopped responding to her. We found out that the next year she gave another kid a hand job on the bus ride back from senior trip. There was an investigation, but everyone involved denied it. The school had a big assembly on S predators, and as far as I know, she still works there. Effing predator. How do some of these teachers get away with this crap? I don't care if the age of consent in whatever state or country that happened in happens to be lower. If that's the case, it's a teacher and a student. There is a power dynamic at play that just makes that crap wrong. Cops, what has so far been the creepiest call you've ever had to respond to? And what happened? Content warning. These stories contain descriptions of self-termination, self-harm, infant and child death, graphic descriptions, and R. Story 1. Got a report of a missing husband. He told his wife and family of six children that he was going to get his tires changed, but never returned, and this was 12 hours ago. They had purchased another house in a neighboring community, and the relationship with the wife was under pressure, so the wife assumed he was staying at the other house and claimed he would never kill himself. The strange thing about this report, though, was that he emptied his personal bank account into his wife's this morning as well. The wife explained this off, saying that they recently had a fight about finances and he agreed that he was bad at money and maybe they should just have a joint account that she controls. On a hunch, I asked his 14-year-old boy if there were any areas in the mountains nearby that his father enjoyed going to and the son identified a road about 10 miles away. It was nearing midnight, but I decided to drive to the top of this old and abandoned forest service road. As I drove through the snow and started to climb the road, I felt a gut feeling that I would 100% find this guy up there either thinking about or already acted out a self-termination. The snow-laid gravel road had some sign of travel but no real indication of how fresh the vehicle tracks could be. As I reached the top of the road after an hour of travel, I was honestly surprised that I did not find his black truck. I spent the drive back down thinking about gut feelings and how they are unreliable but that I somehow felt different about this one. As I traveled up the road, I did notice over a dozen smaller roads branching off, but they were not mapped, and I had already spent too much time on a single occurrence in a busy city with too few police officers. Nevertheless, I decided to check a single of these secondary roads, and about three quarters of the way down, I picked a road at random to check, and sure enough, my headlights lit up the back end of a black truck about 100 yards past the first corner. Even if I hadn't memorized the license plate beforehand, I wouldn't have had to run it. It was clearly his. I radioed that I found the truck, parked my vehicle, and traveled 20 feet to his truck with my heart beating like I was doing it at a sprint rather than a normal walk. What I found inside was a mess of brains and blood caused by a self-inflicted shotgun wound under the chin. I'll save you from the description. There was just something about that gut feeling while traveling this abandoned and quiet mountain road followed by a sense of being tricked by the gut feeling, then finding out it was true by discovering such a gruesome scene, having to wait three hours next to to his truck waiting for body removal, and then to end it all by having to go to the family who was expecting good news to deliver to them the worst news possible. That makes me feel creeped out to this day. Story 2. 
I responded to a report of an unresponsive infant. When I arrived, all the family members were standing around casually in the front yard pointing into the house. I found the baby in the back room laying on her back on a bare mattress. I started CPR but realized the baby was probably already deceased. We rushed her out to the arrival ambulance hoping they had a way to bring her back. I learned she was the mother's second suspicious SIDS death, and I had her other children removed from her care. The difficult part was when I left the scene and went to the ER to see what came of the situation. As I walked in and asked where she was, an ER nurse walked over to me and handed me the deceased baby swaddled in a blanket and told me to wait for someone to show me to the morgue. So I'm standing there in the ER in uniform holding what everyone thinks is a live infant, but rather an infant corpse, and several people stop by wanting to see her and commenting how cute she is to see an officer holding a baby. I just smiled, but it killed me inside. I was ushered back to the morgue after what felt like an eternity and told I had to wait with the baby until the medical examiner arrived. They took the blankets off and laid her on a stainless steel gurney and left me alone with her again. I lounged around the morgue for about an hour waiting. By the time I got home several hours after the end of my shift, because this call came out 15 minutes before the end of my 10-hour shift, I laid down on my bed and cried for a long time. My youngest daughter was in daycare and my wife was at work. I really needed to hold both of them so my house felt incredibly empty. My daughter was only slightly older than the infant, and when I was looking at her earlier I kept seeing my own daughter. I didn't get any sleep at all before going back in for the night shift later that night. I know this thread said creepy stories, but thus far they have only been absolutely heartbreaking. I don't see any way that you could encounter stuff like this without it changing you and requiring some serious therapy. I can't even imagine having to deal with this. Story 3. Detention officer at a local jail here. We had a guy get brought in about 2 a.m. one night who we immediately knew was about to give us a fun time based on the way he was moving, quickly snapping the head back and forth, looking all over the room, etc. One of my coworkers and I stay with the booking officer to help her out when the crap inevitably hits the fan. The guy keeps rambling on throughout the whole process. Parts of his speech are understandable, but most of it is gibberish. At one point, he looks up at my coworker and says, Would you blame me for it? Trying to keep the guy calm, my coworker tells him, Nah, man, no one can blame you. For whatever reason, this set the guy off. He leaps on the bench, and we both push him back down. My coworker is trying to get handcuffs on his other wrist. He was already handcuffed by one hand to the bench. And I'm holding him against the wall with every bit of strength I have. This mother effer was strong. I swear the bench was about to come up off the concrete when he first leapt at us. Once my coworker gets handcuffs on him, we take a step back. The guy throws his head back, eyes rolled all the way back, and lets out an inhuman scream that I've only heard in movies about demon possession. He then moves his head as if he's still looking around the room, but still with his eyes rolled into the back of his head and spouts off more nonsense. I'm not Catholic, but I was very tempted to cross myself. The screaming, head throwing back, and eye rolling continued on for about 45 minutes. Every so often, he'd come back to reality and talk to us like a normal person for a moment, and then go back into crazy mode. Story 4. I was working in the crime unit, aka detective, for the state police agency I work for, and patrol got sent to one of the small towns in the county I work in for a report from neighbors in a series of row home apartments that there was an unbearable smell coming from a second floor apartment. Patrol made entry and found the subject deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. On the way there, the coroner called me. She ran with the local EMS crew and was on scene with the first responding trooper and said, bring your hazmat suit. This is a bad one. I got there and I could smell it from the street. I went upstairs and as I passed the wave of flies, I entered his bedroom. I saw what really couldn't be described as human. It was in the idle July 90 degree heat and the dude was black as a black cat. When I got close, I noticed something odd. He had melted to the floor. The female forensic service girl asked, why is his skin moving? Yep, thousands of maggots were now under his skin, which gave it the appearance that his skin was bubbling and moving. And yes, the gun was still in his right hand. It took the fire department effing shovels to scrape this guy off the floor. Not to mention the smell. Trust me, I've been to swamp bodies, lake bodies, heat bloat, but nothing like this. Crazy crap we see sometimes. And that right there is why my interest in going into forensics didn't last too long. I was seriously considering going to college for it because most bodies and whatnot don't bother me, but the one time I would have to see something like that? Nope. Couldn't do it. Story 6. My dad worked in a precinct with one of the highest crime rates in New York City. 
I think it had the highest murder rate during his year on the job. Anyway, he won't tell the stories about what he's seen because they're mostly horrific and still give him nightmares almost 15 years off the job. However, I do remember he told us one story where he was really drunk. A woman in her 20s walked into her apartment building late from work one night and was waiting for the elevator. It opened and the only person in there was a creepy looking guy. Though apprehensive, she got in and pressed her floor number but noticed that the basement button was pressed. Normally after 9 p.m., maintenance would lock the basement button to prevent random people from going down there and effing with crap. I guess someone forgot to lock it. The creepy guy ended up taking her down there, tying her up, and aring and torturing her for hours. He then took her apartment key, went up to the floors she pressed when she'd first gotten into the elevator, tried every door until he found hers, and took her roommate also a woman in her 20s, into the basement where he continued torturing and aring both of them until dawn. Maintenance found them that morning, and my dad was a responder. Again, my dad never told us stories. This one might have stuck out because he has four daughters, but I think it's gotta be up there in the creepy factor. Story 7. Military Police Officer. So I worked both law enforcement and corrections for a bit. In corrections, the main office was also the police services desk. Often it would ring and no one would be at the other end. Anyways, one time it rang, and instead of a number, it had a descriptor that I don't remember exactly. Something like Emergency Phone 11. I was new and immediately called my superiors about it. They told me to drop it and never report anything like that again. Ominous, right? Anyways, the reason I told that is to tell this. Sometime later on patrol, I got dispatched to essentially an abandoned side on the base to respond to an emergency phone call. No location at first because radio didn't know where emergency phone 11 was, and was new to the base so he didn't get the same memo to not report those calls. Radio then went on to say that the caller had sounded frantic and thought they were being chased, meaning that someone had actually been on the other end. Radio eventually digs up some old maps that label a emergency Radio 11 location and relays them to me and my partner, so we drive there in a hurry. There's no phone, just a broken pole where one had once been. Okay, that is legitimately pretty creepy. How do you not look into that further and try to figure out the mystery? Seriously, I'm the kind of curious, nosy person that would get killed off in a horror movie for looking too deeply into these kinds of things. Story 8. Went to a welfare check. A neighbor called in. He hasn't seen this guy for a few days and the lights have been on for a while. I go and look around and find no footprints or tire marks in the snow, recent storm. I check the garage and nothing. I check the house, which was unlocked, and found the guy's cell phone, keys, wallet, and cash with the TV on. That's when I realized this was now a dead body search. I looked everywhere inside and outside the house and around the garage. There were several old junk vehicles on the property, but again, no tire marks or shoe prints or anything. I called all the recent numbers on his phone and no one heard from him. Only so much I can do, so I issue a BOL and we start getting NCIC paperwork ready. Next day, the day shift officer goes to follow up. Turns out the guy was plowing his driveway and either had a medical condition or something and either passed out or died on the spot and crashed the truck into the other junk cars which then caught on fire. Edit, investigation leads to the fact that this happened a week before I got this call, leaving only a pile of bones in the front seat covered in snow. I felt like crap for not finding him that night, but it was really creepy knowing his remains were inches away from where I was searching. Story one. All right. In high school, my buddy was banging this girl who told everyone she got shot. I asked her to see the bullet wound and she pulled her shirt down a little so I could see her shoulder. You know what was freaking covering her wound? One single ace band-aid. Bonus story. So she told my buddy he got her pregnant, condom did rip, so believable. She told him she wanted an abortion and needed $60 for it. He gave it to her. But I asked her how she was going to get it for $60. She said she was going to the hospital with a fake ID. I forgot the worst of all. She was a loud and proud juggalette. She got a shot. You know, those vaccines are as bad as bullets. Story 2. My brother was in a toxic relationship. He was physically and mentally being abused. Not physically. He did manage to get his abusive girlfriend pregnant. It got to a point where he was actually crying because he just needed to come home with me to our mom. That was the last straw for me, so I said, frick it, come with me. So we grabbed his stuff and we literally ran from her. She was throwing his stuff out the door and screaming. We kept running, but then she yelled, if you don't come back right now, I'm going to stick a knife in my pregnant belly. I wish I was making this up. We, of course, ran back to prevent this. So yeah, that.
Story three. I went to uni with her in no particular order. She was violated repeatedly by an ex-boyfriend who kept on breaking into her room at night. When we reported it to campus security, they never saw anyone enter her room on security cameras. Same ex carved S into her chest with a knife. Never saw any scarring or evidence of any sort. Same ex spray-painted S onto the outside of her window. She lived on the fourth floor of a tower block. While traveling back home for Christmas, she fell over, knocked herself out, came into the hospital, was discharged, and beat the train home she missed because of being knocked out. That particular train journey takes three hours. Whilst at home for Christmas, her dad kept on taking LSD and was asking her to drive him to places in his van, even though she's never had a driving lesson. Was ran over repeatedly by a mutual friend. She just walked into his car. Claimed to be the biggest drug dealer on campus, but no one ever saw her stash. She can speak seven languages fluently, but she can never remember which languages they are. There are so many of these. It was really sad and pathetic. That last one made me laugh. <laughs> Can you imagine speaking seven languages but not remembering which ones? <laughs> That's amazing. This woman needs help, but I can't understand what she needs because she speaks Spanish. Does anyone here speak Spanish? I don't know, but I'll try. Story four. In my sophomore year of high school, I briefly dated, then had an on-again, off-again relationship with this senior in my drama class. We'll call him T.I., as in the idiot. T.I. was awesome when we first met. He told a lot of cool stories and seemed to have an interesting life. He was a little weird, but the fun kind of weird, and very socially savvy, so he was generally well-liked by a lot of the class. Over time, however, I could tell T.I. was a little off. His stories started to seem a little outlandish. For example, how Katy Perry and Ariana Grande kissed him on each cheek at the same time. How he survived a 30-foot fall from a treetop onto a large pole after being unconscious for hours. How he had a fake girlfriend, confirmed to be fake, that he dumped just so he could date me, and other unbelievable stuff like that. Something just wasn't right about this guy. The most attention W thing T.I. ever did was tell our entire class that he had some fatal disease that required surgery, from which he was probably going to die. We weren't dating anymore and in an on phase of our relationship at this point, by the way. He even went as far as saying goodbyes and offering to sell his stuff. Honestly, I could tell that this was probably BS. He didn't know what this disease was except a tumor up near his, and I quote you, you know what. And just because he was a compulsive liar in general, but those who didn't know him as well as I did fell for it. One girl even had to go to counseling because she was so worried about him. He told us this and the Thursday before a week-long Thanksgiving break and that his surgery was the next Tuesday. And if we didn't hear from him by then, by that night, he'd be dead. So I texted him Tuesday night. No response. I texted him on Thursday wishing him Happy Thanksgiving. Nothing. At this point, I actually started to get a little worried. What if something did happen to him? But there he was on Monday, back at school, totally fine. Not in a wheelchair or crutches or even limping. Yeah, I beat him out on it pretty hard. People who fake illness like that for attention just make me mad. There are actually people who are suffering and going through times in their life that are beyond traumatic, and you're using it for a little attention? Nope. F off. Story 7. This girl I knew was the literal definition of attention-seeking. She would always show off and always have to mention how much money and influence she and her family had, and then, in the same breath, would try to convince you she was from the hood. She wasn't. She was literally from the richest area in my city where high-level politicians and famous people live. She would constantly be extremely dramatic and say really disgusting things to get a rise out of people. She'd make really outlandish comments about different races, religions, poor people, the homeless, etc. She voted for Trump simply because she wanted to get a reaction from people. She was the kind of person who needed to one-up literally everyone. If you had a chronic illness, so did she, and it was so much worse than yours. Bad upbringing? Hers was worse. A tragic loss? Nothing compared to what she went through. Had some incredible news? Sucks to suck because hers was better. Her roommate was having some serious mental health issues, and she somehow managed to make it about her and her safety and vilify the poor girl instead of actively helping her seek treatment. She would get drunk and act like a crazy fool, flailing her arms and being loud and physical just so people would watch her. She'd make out with all our mutuals, who she'd refer to as her sons, gross, just to stir up drama. 
She would steal things from people's houses at a party, put it on Snapchat, and then, when she was caught, would delete it and act like it never happened and then play the victim. She lied to everyone about hooking up with a mutual friend of ours. She lost a lot of friends in the past year or two, myself included, because we can't deal with her dramatics and attention-seeking ways anymore. I'm trying to be as non-descriptive as I can because a lot of things she did are very specific, but this is just some of the stuff she's done. If I listed everything, we'd be here all day. I have the time to read more about this girl. <sighs> the thing that makes me a little sad about this person, and frankly other people being talked about on this list, is this behavior might stem from being ignored at home. I know it's a stereotype, but a rich kid being ignored by their parents? I mean, this woman feels like she fits that bill, and I'm a little sad for her. A little. It doesn't make her behavior and actions okay. I feel like we could put this phrase on some mainly facts shirts with how much I say it, but sympathy doesn't erase accountability. Story 8. I had a girl in my class which kept telling lies to make her seem more bad A or that she would be living the best life. She always told everyone she was living on top of the mountain and had to go like five kilometers to school every morning by foot. I was actually friends with her, so I went to her house once and she was living in an apartment which was in an alleyway filled with drunkards. She also said that she was part of some group that were basically freelancers and that she would do life-threatening tasks every day, but she also said it would have to stay a secret even though she basically just screamed it around the whole school. Overall, her stories about that group had so many cliches like they had a member which was a 12-year-old which were frickin' berserk every time he saw blood because his parents were killed in front of him and that they had some 12-year-old scientist who apparently built some sort of gun that they'd use on the berserk kid to calm him down. She also said that she had a rival or something because apparently she kept getting followed by a dude that knew her code name, but every time she chased him, he would apparently jump on a frickin' roof and run off. The stories also had a lot of logic failures. She once told that the group was building gliders for forest missions to jump from tree to tree easier even though the gliders would be way too wide and they just break the wings because it would collide with every possible tree. Once she also told us that the group would have a 12-year-old member that for some reason had access to guns and that he shot a fist-sized hole through her wrist during a training session. She apparently didn't even get medical treatment, but instead just put a bandage around half of her arm. But in school, she was able to move her arm completely normal, and there were never any traces of a wound, not even some blood or something. So nobody ever believed her, and she became the most hated of the class. At the end of the year, she had to leave the school because her grades were too bad, and she kept telling that it was just because of French, and that she would have the best grades of everybody, even though the truth was that she had a D in almost every class, and even multiply E, which you can make you leave the school here in Germany. By the way, she was also just 12 years old. Sounds like she watched too much anime. I'll be honest, all 12-year-olds sound like this girl to me, but I am nearing 40, so I think that's just the crotchety old man in me starting to show. You punk kids and your animes and forest gliders. <laughs> Story 13. My fiancé has been my best friend since we were kids. Once in high school, he was dating a girl who decided that after scaring the crap out of him by trying to cuff him to the bed against his will, she was going to threaten to kill herself if he dumped her. About ten years later, I ran into her at a party. She was there with her husband and infant son, not the kind of party you take a baby to, but okay. She proceeded to tell me how they never technically broke up since, being fifteen years old, to his answer to, if you dump me I'll kill myself, was to just stop talking to her. And because of that, they were technically still together and she was cheating on him with her husband, making her son a bastard. She was 100% serious, and she also told me to tell him she wanted an apology. This was in front of a lot of very stunned people. Man, I feel bad for her husband. Story 14. There was a girl in my college that constantly would say crap. During orientation, she told people she was recovering from brain cancer, didn't happen, and was partially deaf. She wasn't. She then found out my friend had epilepsy, so she started doing these exaggerated tremors. She would then fake seizures all the time for all of the years she was there, which was a pain in the butt because I would have to treat them like real ones. She did it once during a power outage for the most attention possible. She did it so often that once 911 hung up on someone calling it in because they knew it was her. Since I keep getting comments about 911 hanging up, I feel like I should mention that the person who called was also a dispatcher. Sounds like a pathological liar. 
please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.